Hit that like and subscribe. We got some more juicy news here. Hear this audio recording with Harry O. Harris. He was a godfather, a major drug dealer who not only worked with the Cali cartel, but the Crips and the Bloods to sell $2 million of cocaine a day. He was put in prison for 33 years, recently pardoned by Trump. After a year and a half out and free, he's emerged in Los Angeles to build a new studio called Boss City Studios in Studio City with Snoop Dogg. He's the COO of a new Death Row Records that's now going to be launching in the metaverse. I think you'll find this to be of great nostalgia, but also of great promise for what Death Row and rap and hip-hop means for the future, as seen by one of its founders, Michael Harry O. Harris. Here's our exclusive conversation. Michael Harry O. Harris, thank you for inviting us into your studios. They're beautiful and sharing your life story with us. It's my honor. I've been watching your work for years. It's just, you do people so much justice. You know, it's just to have an opportunity to be able to speak with you is a truly an honor. Well, it's an honor to speak with you. I mean, you. You've been busy. You were behind bars for 33 years, Lompoc, San Quentin, some of the toughest, highest security prisons in the country, in the world. Yes. And you've just been out a year and a half, not even, and you've built all this. Uh, you've just hit the ground running, haven't you? Yeah, I had a lot to make up for. I just felt like I had a lot of energy that I needed to engage the world with, and uh, I've been doing it. When you spend more than three decades behind bars and you get out, can you just step right back in and as if you never were behind bars? When you're in a situation like I was in for 33 years, it starts there. How do you how do you deal with that journey? And it's the way you deal with that journey is how you deal with your reentry. While you're in, you have to do things that not only preserve you health wise, but mentally. So that when that blessed day come and you are released after you've done your time, you are able to engage the present world as it is. If you're prepared for that, then I believe it's an easier transition. Did you feel free like right away or did it take you a minute? I feel free right away. <laughs> free right away. No, I'm just being honest. It's weird. It's like it's like I just we just went to the store or something, you know, it's like I'm going down Pacific Highway and and uh, coming from Long Park, and I just just felt like I never left. Right, and you went in at 26, and you got out at 60. Yes, well, it's 59, yes. 59. Yeah, I turned 60 since I was out, yes. You were one of the last pardons by then-President Trump. On his 11th hour, you had asked President Obama for a pardon. You were not granted that under his administration. Twice. Twice. When you heard that in the literally the last hour of his presidency, getting on that chopper, leaving the White House, that you were among those names. What went through your mind? It was a powerful moment. I will be forever grateful for Donald Trump for pardoning me because I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. I wouldn't be able to be present with my family and uh, to be able to engage the business world and and to be able to finish something that I started when I was young on the positive tip. And I know people feel certain ways about our previous president for different reasons. Do you feel loyalty toward him? I do. I do. I I, I think that he did something that he didn't have to do. In pardoning you. But when his critics say he did something good for me, but maybe not for my community, how do you reconcile that? Well, well, I I think that needs to be fixed. (laughs) Of course. I think that he has done some things to help the black community, though. Like... The First Step Act helped so many families reunite with their family members. That was something that he passed. And I know that his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, and his daughter, Ivanka, was really, really uh, the engine behind it. But they had his support to do it. Alice Johnson, who uh, has also came out under Donald Trump, and she fought tooth and nail. My understanding is... Once Donald understood who I became over the years and the work that I had done, he says, are you kidding me? You're going to leave this guy in prison who created a company while he was in prison and using that against him.
also Snoop Dogg. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I can give you a list of people, the powerful people uh, who are... Advocated for your release. They advocated, like Man Jones has been a good friend of mine, Chris Redless, Hammer, and Snoop Dogg went all the way in for me, you know? This is my brother, you know? That's my little brother. <laughs> and we both grown men, but I still consider him my little brother. And I'm very proud of him. Uh, he's been there since, he's been there even when I was gone. But he really pulled, helped pull me out of there. He just says, that's my friend. If there's any way that you can see fit to him coming home, we would love it. Well, it happened, and you had a homecoming unlike any other. All of the artists, the legendary artists, are on that big Super Bowl worldwide stage. Part of death row, giving hip-hop its due. And here you were to actually experience that. Uh, Dr. Dre invited me to the uh, rehearsals, and he wanted me to see him and, uh, up close and personal. Was it emotional for you? Yeah. Yeah. I was glad to see it, and it affected me more because... To see the conductor, Dr. Dre, who was a part of our original uh, creation, and, and Snoop Dogg, <laughs> who is just, it's like, the, it, just don't, it just don't stop. To see them 30 years after we released The Chronic on, on stage, and just as relevant today as they were those days. Everybody that played a part and that sent the message to the world that hip hop is relevant, is strong, and it's a professional organization. Dre's in his 50s, and the importance of hip hop getting its due on that stage. Talk to me about that. I remember in, in his early infancy stage, a lot of people just kept counting it out that this was going to be a fad. It would last three weeks, but it has become a fabric of our society. It's in everything, movies, it's in commercials. You know, people are able to communicate outside of hip hop and hip hop has become mainstream. It has changed uh, the whole trajectory of the music business. It's one of the most powerful genres in, hip, in, the, in the music business worldwide. And people are still coming into the fold of hip hop in other countries. The fact that we're, we're coming into our 50th year next year uh, I'm very excited and I work with different organizations uh, to celebrate that 50th year uh, anniversary of hip-hop. I keep focusing.